Okay, so good morning. How is everyone today? Good? So what did we talk about last time? Giraffes. Sorting. Giraffes. So uh, we talked about uh, sorting. Any questions about uh, sorting? We're just starting on quick sort, right? Uh, yes, we had we had discussed quick sort. And then we had a we had a an assignment about making bubble sort and quick sort. We'll do mer merge sort a little later for an assignment. Second. Okay. So any questions about sorting? This is okay. Okay. So uh, now uh, we're going to start using MATLAB in a slightly slightly different way. So on the one hand, you can use MATLAB to write programs like we have, uh, but MATLAB uh, also can be used to some degree as a really advanced uh, graphing calculator, that kind of thing. So. Uh, Today we're going to discuss using using MATLAB in that way. Okay, so uh, for example, suppose uh, suppose I ask you to do the following. <coughs> so this this part is hidden. You can't. So this is invisible. Suppose that I say, okay, x minus 3 multiplied by x minus 8. This is x squared uh, <coughs> minus 11x plus 24. So, so that, that's all invisible. And then suppose I say, okay, please factor, uh, please factor x squared minus 11x plus 24. Okay, so this one's, this one's easy enough that we can all memorize specialized methods to do this. So, so how is it that, that you do this? Quadratic formula, right, would, would work in every conceivable case. Uh, but I'm asking for, what, what's the very first thing that you ever learn on doing these? Right. You, you, want, you want two numbers whose product is this one and whose sum is that one. So can we think of any, any, any two numbers that do that? <laughs> okay. okay, very good. So, uh, terrific. Okay, so any question? So do we all remember this. Okay. So suppose that uh, now this is the hidden bit. Suppose that I, I go back to my secret uh, laboratory and, and do this. Well, surely that would be x squared minus 11x plus 24 multiplied by x minus 1. Uh, and then this would be what? x cubed minus 11 <coughs> x squared plus 24 x minus x squared plus 11 x minus 24. So that I could say, okay, would you please factor, uh, would you please factor x cubed, uh, and then what? Minus 12x squared twenty-four plus eleven is thirty-five. And then 
minus 24. Okay, so you can't see that stuff above, right, because we're going with the fiction that that's hidden. Okay, so then how do you go about solving this problem? So can you remember how it's done? It might have been a while. Yeah? You can do a Q over P one. What does that mean, Q over P? Uh, it's uh, all the possible terms of the final uh -huh. term uh, divided by all the possible terms of the coefficient, or all the possible factors of the coefficient of the first term. Okay. So uh, the, the, name, the name for, for this thing you're talking about, it, ha it has a specific name, is called the Rational Zeros Theorem. The Rational Zeros Theorem says that if you have a, a polynomial and all of the coefficients are rational, so in particular, I can, that it can be said even more strongly to say all the coefficients are integers, uh, then, then the Rational Zeros, if any, must be uh, plus or minus a divisor of the constant term divided by a divisor of the leading term. So uh, let, let's, let's write that out. So these are the candidates, candidates. So plus or minus, uh, what are the divisors of the uh, constant term? One, two, three, four, not five, six, yes, eight, no, and not seven, not ten, not eleven, twelve, yes, and twenty-four. So, so how do you tell, how, how can you assure yourself that you didn't miss any? Pair them up, right? So, uh, one and twenty-four, yeah, two and twelve, yeah, three and eight, four and six, good. So we pro probably didn't miss any, or at least we didn't find any that weren't paired up. Okay, so that means that how many candidates are there? A lot. A lot. <laughs> well, because there's just one in the denominator, there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of those, but then multiplied by two because we can take plus or minus. Okay, so then uh, there's 16 candidates. So now, then the rational zeros theorem says, uh, there's, a, there's another bit that usually goes with the rational zeros theorem called uh, the rule of signs, Descartes' rule of signs, which helps you take those, those choices and then be a little bit more intelligent. But suppose we don't know the rule of signs. What are we supposed to do now? Start trying them all. Okay, and, ha and uh, how do we try them? So I agree that we've got to, in principle, try them all, but how is it that you do a try? Yeah? Okay, so we'll do that. Do you remember synthetic division? So uh, it's called synthetic division in college algebra and may maybe also in um, pre-calculus. But since y'all are all math majors, uh, you should know that the math major term for this is called Horner's method. Uh, because originally what the, the the, the purpose of, of this, this thing was actually to evaluate a polynomial quickly. And it's just a neat side effect that, it, that also t ends up to be division. Okay. So uh, what do we do? How are we supposed to do it? Uh -huh. So uh, let's, let's try, you know, just, just to make it clear how it works, let's, let's try two first. What is the right answer? What's going to be the right answer, by the way? Any one of those, right? <laughs> yeah. One, three, and eight, but, but we're going to ignore that for a minute. So then I wrote two outside the house, uh, the upside-down house, so now what? Okay, so one, uh, negative 12, 35, negative 24. Okay, so the way this works is uh, you alternate uh, adds and, uh, sorry, multiplies and adds. So this one uh, just goes straight down uh, and becomes a one. 
So it's like the one snuck outside the house. Uh, but the one wants to, you know, ran away, but now it's hungry and wants a sandwich, so it has to get back in the house. Uh, but to get back in, it has to go by the door. Okay, so to get back in, it has to be multiplied by two. So this comes back in, and as it, as it does it, it's multiplied by two. So now that we've done that, now what? Now you, you add these two together, you add this column together, and then they sneak out. So negative 10. So negative, negative 10 snuck out. Uh, but now it wants to come back in. <coughs> but what happens when it gets back inside? Multiplied by 2. So uh, negative 20. Now what? Add them together. 15 snuck out. 15 once back in. Multiply it by 2. <coughs> so that's 30. Add them. We get a 6. So what does that tell us about our try? Didn't, Didn't work. How, what, what specifically would happen if, how will we specifically know that, that we, we guessed correctly? Yeah, this, this one right here will be 0. The reason why is because what, what this is actually doing what this method is actually doing, it's actually evaluating at 2. So w what, this, what we did here is we, we plugged in 2 into this expression. And if you plug in 2, you get 6. Okay, uh, so we, we have this one, but, and, and secretly we're hiding from ourselves that, that the polynomial factors like this. What can you plug in? So now, remembering that it looks this way, what, what can you plug in so that uh, you'd get zero. Any one of those, right? Any one of those you'd plug in. Okay. So now let's, to, to show what it's like for it not to work, that, that's what it looks like when it doesn't work. Now let's see what it looks like when it does work. Uh, so which correct guess are we going to try? It doesn't matter. Which one do you like? Three? Okay. Okay, so same story. The one sneaks out to get back in. Multiply by 3. Add those together. Multiply by 3. Add those together. Multiply by 3. Add those together. And we're so happy about that, getting that 0, that I'm going to turn the 0 into a smiley face. So what, is that, what does that tell you, getting a 0? That, that means that you have, you have found a factor. What, what factor have you found? X minus 3. So as a result of this, you know that x cubed minus 12x squared plus 35x minus 24, you know that one of the factors is x minus 3. But and the reason why this method is important, you also know the other factor. What's the other factor? Right, it's read off by these coefficients. x squared minus 9x plus 8. So, 1x squared, negative 9x is eight units, and that one goes there. Okay, so now we haven't completely, we haven't completely factored uh, this polynomial, but now that what's <coughs> left is a quadratic, now we have even better methods to, to use. So can you, can you factor this one? How does it factor? How about, yeah, can you think of two numbers whose product is negative eight and whose sum is negative nine? Sure, yeah, that's easy enough. So x minus 3 multiplied by x minus 1 multiplied by x minus 9. So can, can we all agree that, you know, in principle I could select, uh, you know, like 10 different numbers uh, and, and do, x minus, do the product of x minus this number multiplied by x minus that number? Yes? Uh, should that be x minus 8 on that last term? Thank you. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so is it right now? <laughs> okay, good. So, so I could select a bunch of different numbers, and then you could carefully do this, you know, and you, you could in principle factor a polynomial of degree 20 with a lot of trial and error. You could in principle do that. Okay, great. Uh, that's nice to know, but, um, you know, I, I, in my opinion, th things like this is why we made machines in the first place, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> How about let's not do this? Let's just make a tool that does this. Okay, so MATLAB can do this. Uh, MATLAB can do this quite, quite efficiently, and one of our, uh, one of our assignments for corresponding to this lecture will be factoring polynomials. Yes? Did you say if you plug in two, you get six there? <laughs> if you plug two into this polynomial, you get six. Let, let, so it seems like you're not real sure about that. Let, let's, let's confirm that. So uh, I'm going to take this polynomial and plug in two. So two cubed minus 12 times two squared plus 35 times 2 minus 24. Are we in agreement? So this would be, this would be what? 8 uh, for minus 48 and then plus 70 and then minus 24. So combining these two that would be negative 40. Combining these two uh, 70 minus 24 46 plus 46 and then those you get 6. So you might you might be concerned, you know, what you know, why is it that this does evaluation? Let's let's look at that for a minute. So let's take that that specific polynomial for a moment. Uh, so it can be represented like this. So x cubed minus 12x squared plus 35x uh, minus 24. So what I'd like for you to observe about these four terms uh, is that, uh, well, they don't all have an x. Okay, and furthermore, concern, con considering their coefficients b being integers, they don't also have a common factor, right? Like I can't factor out a 2, I can't factor out an x. Uh, but what I'd like for you to observe is that I if, if we were to ignore for a moment uh, the last term, do you observe that all of those have an x? Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that. Let's factor an x out of those three. So doing that would look like this. Uh, x and then multiplied by what would I have to put in here? Very good, x squared minus 12x plus 35 and then minus 24. Okay, so now let's ignore everything that's not inside of the parentheses. So ignore all of that for a moment and I'll say, well, considering those three terms, there's not a greatest factor. They don't all have an x. But I if we ignore the last term, do you observe that they all have an x? Ah, yeah. oh, they do all have an x. So let's factor an x out of those. And, and if we were to do that, it would be uh, x minus 12, <coughs> like so and then plus 35, and then minus 24. <coughs> okay. So now let's ignore everything except the innermost parentheses. And I'd like for you to observe that, that uh, well, we've got two terms there. We've got x and also 12. And they, they don't have any common factors. But if we were to ignore everything except that one, do you observe that an x could be factored out of that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm, so I'm going to do it. 
So x, 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 minus 12, plus 35, minus 24. So, so now, this is kind of a weird way to write a polynomial, isn't it? Uh, as, far, as far as like uh, intelligibility, this one is, is probably more, at, at least this one ha has going for it that it's easier to write, this one up here. But let's consider, what would it, what would it mean? What, how, how, could you, how could you plug in a value into this? Well, suppose we want to do that. Suppose we want to plug in 2 then according to the way the parentheses are, are arranged, we'd have to first take that 1 and then multiply by 2. And after we've multiplied by 2, we'd have to, we'd have to add that to negative 12. And then after we've done that, we'd have to take that result and multiply it by 2. And then after we've done that, we'd have to add that to 35. And we take that result and multiply it by 2 and then add all of that to negative 24. Do you observe that that's exactly what that table is doing? Take the 1, multiply by 2, add negative 12. Multiply by 2, add 35. Multiply by 2, add negative 24. It's precisely what this table does. Take the 1, multiply by 2, add negative 12. Multiply by 2, add 35. Multiply by 2, add negative 24. So all that, all that this table really is it's just a short way to write this representation of a polynomial and then evaluate quickly without having to write all the x's. It's just a nice uh, happenstance that this also uh, co coincides with computing the coefficients of the quotient in the remainder of division. That's nice. Good. Any, any other questions about Horner's method? Okay, it, it does. It, it does as long as you as long as you write <coughs> the missing zeros. So so to be clear, with an example, say, suppose that we have f of x is three x three uh, x cubed uh, plus five x minus nine. So it's missing an x squared. Uh, if I if the request was uh, to evaluate f at uh, 5, say, uh, yeah, 5 would be fine, then you could do it like this. 3, 0, 5, negative 9, 5. Okay, then, you know, you could imagine that you factored the polynomial in this way, or represented it in this way, uh, so take the 3, multiply by 5, add the 0, <coughs> multiply by 5, add the 5, multiply by 5, add the negative 9. Okay, other questions? What is the name again of this panel? It is called... Horner's method. Uh, to, a, to a mathematician. But if you find yourself teaching a college algebra class, uh, then for reasons that I still can't figure out, uh, it's referred to as synthetic division. Good. So, <coughs> so what I'm what I'm telling you is that uh, you know remember all those times you had to factor a polynomial in your in your math classes back in the day. What I'm telling you is that from now on, please don't do that uh, by hand. From now on, please do it with MATLAB. So, for, for example, I, I, it, it so happens that I teach college algebra. 
So I've got to make college algebra assignments, and uh, you know the the way that I make them is I don't I don't uh, I don't actually usually multiply them out by hand. I have I have a computer do it, and I don't usually factor them. I have a computer do it, and that way I don't make any silly errors. Okay, uh, another example. <coughs> problem about polynomials. Uh, let's consider that we have a polynomial that is already factored. Uh, so for example, uh, negative, negative 3 multiplied by, say, x plus uh, 1. And I'll say that that's to exponent 2 multiplied by x minus 3. Uh, then multiplied by x minus, uh, how about, 5. And we'll do that to exponent 3. Suppose we have this polynomial. Uh, a, a, com a common task is to sketch what this polynomial should look like. Okay, just, just provide a, a sketch, not... Not, not plotting it, uh, like in the sense of plotting hundreds of points, not like this, but just give a sketch to give the general idea of what it uh, ought to look like. So, in the, in, in the first place, let's ask ourselves, uh, how, about, uh, how about this? What do I want to say? In the first place, what's the degree of this polynomial? Six. It's six. Okay, and, and I, I'm, I feel certain we all are quite comfortable with this, but could someone tell me just how you came up with that? The x squared in the first binomial term, single x in the next one, and x cubed in the third one, and then you just multiply those together to get x to the sixth. Okay, so you, you, if, if I, I believe you're saying that if you multiplied these all out and collected like terms, the highest degree term would be six. Yeah. Okay, I agree with that. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> and a, 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 a different but equivalent way is to say that, okay, because all of these are degree one terms uh, and they're raised to an exponent, uh, then you can find the degree of the whole polynomial by, by taking all of those and adding them together. Okay, so its, so it's degree is six. Okay, furthermore, how about what is the sign of the leading coefficient? negative. So we, we can do even better. Uh, I'm just asking for the sign, but you, you, you in fact, sh I believe, can tell me exactly what the leading coefficient is. What is it? Negative. It's negative 3. Very good. <coughs> so here's uh, another question. Uh, as x goes to the left, what does y do? So is it, it so so what I'm saying is that if we're going to plot it, if, if we were to plot it, and as you start going to the left, what's y going to do? It's going to decrease. It's going to yeah. decrease. Yeah. And how is it that you know this? Even degree. Okay, because it, because it has even degree, even degree, and a negative leading coefficient. So, so, so all even degree polynomials, if you zoom out far enough, they all look like parabolas, kind of. Uh, they're, they either have both sides going up or both sides going down. Okay, so then uh, because this is negative, both <coughs> sides are going down. So y to negative uh, infinity. And similarly, as x goes to infinity, uh, to, to the right, what does y do? It, it, it also will go to negative infinity. Okay. Uh, well, what are what what zeros are there? So what are they? Negative, negative one, three. positive three, and positive five. So there's three zeros, and then for 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 the purpose of of plotting, what does that tell you? Right. 
that means that that you'll be cross you'll be touching or crossing the x-axis uh, at at those values. Okay. Uh, furthermore, furthermore, uh, this is this this polynomial is degree six. It's degree six, uh, but it only has three zeros. And that's kind of a half that's kind of a half truth, right? Uh, because remember that that the fundamental theorem of algebra says that every polynomial of degree one, one or more has at least one root, one zero. And then it, the immediate consequence of that is that, um, is that a polynomial of degree n has exactly n zeros, uh, where n is more than one, and, and we're in the, you know, you have to say things about complex numbers and things like that, but I'm going to ignore that. How, so this polynomial of degree six really should have six zeros. So how do we, how do we fix up the accounting? Right, which is to say that, for example, this one, th this, this zero, negative one, is going to be counted twice. Why twice? Yeah, so that's the, that's the word I was fishing for but trying not to say. Multiplicity, right? So the multiplicity of this one is two. What's the multiplicity of, uh, what's the multiplicity of this one? One, and what's the multiplicity of this one? Three. Okay. So now, what I what I want is I want you to have uh, I want to make a sketch of this polynomial that uh, correctly places all the zeros, correctly places the the end behavior to the to the left and to the right and also correctly depicts the local behavior near the zeros. Okay? So in particular what I want you to remember is that all polynomials <coughs> so this is a little remark within this example all polynomials uh, can kind of be broken down into groups and you can analyze their behavior like so. So maybe we have a polynomial that, that does this. Uh, if you get far enough to the right, it starts going up forever. And you get far enough to the left, it starts going down forever. Okay, so ignoring what's happening in the middle for a moment. If you came across such a polynomial, you should be able to tell me the parity of it. What's its parity? Odd. odd. This is an odd polynomial because the behavior left and right is opposite. Uh, this particular example, the behavior left and right should be the same. Uh, and in particular, that one is going to look like this. Okay, it's going to be the fact that the left and right behavior is, the, is both down uh, means that it's even. Uh, very good. So then polynomials will eventually do that, and then they've got some kind of nice, interesting behavior in the middle. Uh, so something like this, say. So this, just for the sake of, to give something a name, I'll refer to this, this behavior as the global behavior and this behavior as the local behavior. So what, what I want your sketch to depict is I want it to correctly depict uh, the, the global behavior and also the local behavior. So taking this, we should plot uh, the zeros. So there's, there's three of them. So there's a zero at negative one. Uh, there's a zero at three. And there's a zero at uh, five. So now we've established we've established that we ought to do this. It's got to be this way. Uh, so from five, going to the right, what are we supposed to do? Got to go down. So we've got to be, you know somehow down here like this, going this way, after, after 5. And then from negative 1 going to the left, uh, what have we got to do? We, we also must go down and, and to the left. Okay, now we need to figure out, so this, this is the global behavior, and now we've got to figure out uh, how the zeros are going to affect the local behavior. So we're going to have to go up to meet this uh, this zero, 
gonna have to, we're gonna have to trace up to it. And my question is, is that when we get there, what's going to happen? Are we going to, yeah, are we going to end up crossing the axis, in a sense, or are we gonna bounce off the axis? We're gonna bounce off of it. Uh, so specifically, it's going to look like something like this. So you're gonna come up to meet it, and then go back down. And how, how do you know that, that that's what's going to occur? You gotta draw big dots so it looks right. <laughs> how do you know that, that, that you're gonna bounce off and not, not end up crossing? Right, so it's the, it's the multiplicity so of, of that zero. That means that locally, local to that zero, if you were to, to draw a little box right there, it's gonna end up looking like a parabola. Okay, so now we we in a sense exited the local the region that's local to that to that zero, and now what are we going to have to do from here? Yeah, we're going to have to come back up to meet the three, and then what's going to happen when we get there? We're going to cross it. So why are we going to cross it? Because the multiplicity is one. Okay, and in particular. Uh, what, what is the shape of polynomials that have degree one? Lines, right? So when you cross three, you're gonna cross it like a line. It's gonna, it's gonna be re relatively flat when you do it. So local to three, you know, if you were to just take a little picture there, it's gonna look like a line. Okay, then from, from here, what? Yeah, we're gonna have to come back down to five. Uh, are we going to cross five or bounce off of five? Cross five. Uh, why are we gonna cross? Because it has odd multiplicity. Will we cross like a line, like we did at three? No, how are we gonna cross five? like a cubic, <coughs> we're gonna cross five like a cubic, like an S-curve. Uh, the reason is because that, that zero is multiplicity three, so we're gonna come down to five and do something like the following. Okay. So now this is just a sketch, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure that, you know, so, Probably this one is going to be is going to be quite a bit sharper. It probably goes up re really pretty pointy. This is just a sketch. So, do you remember this lovely task from uh, <laughs> what whatever class you did it in? Probably pre-calculus. Okay. So here here's uh, here. So one one nice thing in pre-calculus is that very often, at least when I I haven't taught it in a while, but when I would teach it. Uh, I'd, give, I'd give them this, but multiply it all out, <laughs> so that they'd have to actually factor it. What a lovely task. Uh, so they've got they've to they've factor it somehow, and then once they've factored it, uh, then they've got to, you know, then they've got to do exactly this, and then provide the sketch, etc. So if you were given such an exercise, you could just type it into MATLAB and say, MATLAB, I need you to factor this, and then does it for you. Uh, and, and even better than that, you can just ask MATLAB to plot it for you. Okay, why, why sketch it when you can have MATLAB actually plot it? So, so this, uh, that, that's part of what we're gonna do uh, for this week's assignment. So any question about this task? Okay, another task, another thing to consider. is uh, let's consider uh, the two, these two functions. So how about the function f of x is equal to x over x, and the function g of x is equal to one. So my question to you is, are these the same function? I heard yes and no, and one of these answers is correct. <laughs> I'm 
They're not the same. They're not the same function. Okay, now why not? Well, to be the same, for functions to be the same, it must be the case that their domains are the same, and furthermore, at every in, at, at, for, for every point in the domain, the, the output is the same. That's what it means for two functions to be the same. Okay, so are they the, so the question is, are they the same? Are, and specifically, the, the proper math word for this, are, are these two functions equivalent? So equivalent means, uh, do they have, is the domain the same? Well, for, to, to address that question, you have to remember that the, that the rule for functions which, which are defined by expressions is that when the domain is not explicitly stated, what is the domain understood to be? Not, not all of R. Not the naturals. <laughs> when the domain's not explicitly stated, the domain is something called the natural domain. So what's, what is the natural domain of an expression? Right, the largest set on which the expression can be defined. So what is, what is uh, that being the case, what is the, what is the natural domain of x over x? Everything but zero. So the domain of f The domain of f uh, is, well, negative infinity to 0, union 0 to infinity, whereas the domain of g is what? The whole shebang, right? Good. So, so the fact that these domains are, are not the same set means that these two functions are uh, not equivalent. Now, when you give a stylized plot of these two functions, then, then it becomes, it, to, to me anyway, a little, a little more obvious. Uh, if you were to plot g, which is a particularly simple function, then how would g look if you were to plot it? Horizontal line. Couldn't be, couldn't be any more straightforward. Whereas, if you were to plot f, how would it look? Straight line with a little hole at zero. Right. So the, sty the stylized representation of it is to draw it like this. And then now my question is, is considering these two pictures, are they the same picture? Good. They're not, right? So that, that's the reason why these two functions mm -hmm. are not the same. Uh, now, that being said, so if I say that this is 1, that being said, if I, give you, if I give you these two functions, consider the function p of x is x over x. Uh, it, p of x is x over x, uh, say, on 5 to 20. And q of x is 1 on 5 to 20, then I could ask the same question. Are p and q the same function? They are, right? Because what's the domain of p? 5 to 20, because I've explicitly stated that. And the domain of q is also the same. So now the, these are equivalent. They are equivalent because, well, you can kind of look at it from a picture point of view. It's like saying, uh, well, you know, the only place where they're any different is near the y-axis, but we cut out that piece. So, you know, here's 5 and 20, 5 and 20. Are these the same? Sure they are. Same. Okay. So now, what's the, what's the name for this graphical feature? A hole. <laughs> yeah, we have to have a name for it. So it's a hole. Okay. Good. So how about, uh, for example, 
How about, for example, uh, this function, the, these functions? Uh, what do I, how do how do I want to say this? Let's do this one. Let's consider just momentarily uh, this function. Oh, good. We we already talked about this when we were doing division. So I can just be fast and loose. So uh, what does this one look like? So <laughs> what's the name of this function? The reciprocal function. Or the, uh, well, at any rate, reciprocal is good <coughs> enough. And the name of this shape is uh, hyperbola. OK, so um, now. What I want to what I want to point out is that you know this 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 f down here has an interesting thing going on there, and this f has an interesting thing going on too, and in a sense the interest is caused by a division by zero. So this f up here uh, has a hole in its plot as a result of there being a division by zero, uh, and this one has what's the name of this feature? A, a vertical asymptote in particular. So it has a vertical asymptote uh, as a result of a division by zero. So division by zero can cause interesting things, but it's not always the same thing. So in this case, in this case the result is a hole, and in this case the result is an asymptote. Okay. So let's compare that to, for example, uh, how about g of x is 1 over, say, x minus 2, what, what will, how does that affect things? Right. So algebraically, you can kind of look at it and say, oh, well, yeah, there can still be a division by 0. That would occur at 2. So the interesting feature, whatever it is, is going to be at, uh, at 2. So in this case, the picture looks something like <coughs> okay. <coughs> well, what about uh, what about this one? that do? Now it's going to be a hole, right? So what I want you to observe is that this H is just like this one in the sense that if you were to suspend, suspend the, the possibility that, that X could be 2, if we were to suspend that for a moment and cancel these, then this would be equal to 1. So this is going to be equal to 1 everywhere except where it couldn't possibly be equal to anything. Uh, at two, so vi visually, what you would see, the way to s the, the stylized representation of this uh, looks like this. Okay. <clears throat> well, what about this one, uh, F G H? P's next, right? <laughs> How about, so in a sense what I want to point out is that, well, you could kind of cancel uh, a little bit. That's what makes the, the asymptote go away. But you can't cancel it completely and, like, in a sense, what's left over is this hole. Uh, what if we do this? So, so can, can we agree that there's a problem at two? We're all in agreement. Okay. Can we also agree that, uh, well, you could cancel some, some stuff? But not all of it. Okay, but not all of it. So if we were to do this, how would it look? It, it would look just like that one. 
just like that one. Okay, what if I change the game slightly and say, okay, Q of X, Q of X is, say, X minus 2 squared over X minus 2 like this. So now I'm, the game I'm playing is, okay, well, I made this one, I made, I made there be two copies in the denominator now and one in the numerator, so now I'm doing it the other way. So now what? So if, if you were to cancel it, if you were to ignore the problem at two for a moment, and you were to make the cancellation, what would be left? Just x minus two. And what does x minus two look like? A line. Will the plot of q be a line? Kind of. <laughs> so, so I agree with kind of, so, uh, but not exactly. So it's going to be a line except for what? A hole at two. So if you were to plot this, then it would look like this. So at zero, it would be negative two, and then <coughs> so that, that's supposed to be a flat. So imagine that it is. <coughs> uh, good. So what I w kind of wanna, what I'm trying to set up with these examples is, is the notion that, okay, all of these functions that I've drawn, that I've, that I've written, uh, they're all functions that are a polynomial in the numerator divided, a pol divided by a polynomial in the denominator. So it's the ratio of two polynomials. So what's the name of these kind of functions? Rational functions. Rational functions. So um, when, you're, when you're dealing with rational functions and, and their behavior, uh, their behavior is in large part governed by the zeros which occur in the numerator and the zeros which occur in the denominator. <coughs> so let's consider a uh, more complicated example. So how about f of x is something like this. So x minus 1, x minus 3, x minus 5, and then over <coughs> x minus 3, x minus 8, <coughs> uh, and how about x minus 5? OK, so now I'm going to put some factors on these. Sorry, I don't mean factors. I mean exponents. Uh, so uh, let's make this one 1. So I'll write it as a 1. And I'll make this one 2. I'll leave that one alone. I'm going to make this one uh, 4 and this one 3. OK. <coughs> So this is a rational function because it's the ratio of two polynomials. <coughs> and we did ourselves a favor of, of already having them factored, so we don't have to go through the hassle of factoring them in the first place. But, you, but can you imagine that I could have given it to you all multiplied out, and you'd have to, you'd have to factor it? OK, with MATLAB. <coughs> OK, <coughs> so now uh, the, the, the points of interest is I want to know what's happening what is happening happen in at each zero of the numerator and denominator? <clears throat> OK. So in particular, what we, what we want to do is we want to classify each one of those 
uh, <coughs> uh, each one of those points uh, in the following uh, kind of way. So what's one of the things that could happen at a zero in the numerator? Like what's one of the conceivable possibilities? Could be a hole. That's a conceivable possibility. Uh, what's another uh, conceivable possibility for a zero which is in the numerator? It, so you're saying it could actually it could actually cross. Yeah. Okay. So it, so I'll say that it is it is actually uh, uh, actually a zero of the function. So that's we'll give it that name. Another I guess suitable name would be an x-intercept. So it could actually be one. What's another conceivable possibility? <coughs> there is another one. <coughs> Think about it. So <clears throat> how about this one? So what's one of the zeros of the numerator of p? 2. But what actually happens at 2? An asymptote occurs there. OK. <clears throat> so in particular, a vertical asymptote. So I'll write that as a VA. <clears throat> So my, my question, the question I want us to, uh, to address is how do you tell which situation you're in? How do you tell which situation you're in? <clears throat> so how about for, how about, what, what would it mean <clears throat> to be, how do, you, how do you detect if you're at a hole? So for example, this particular F, does it have any holes? At 5. It has a hole at 5. Now in, in sort of plain language, can you explain why, why there's a hole at 5? OK, or equal. So, so I agree that in this specific case, it, it, is, it is strictly greater than, because 4 is more than 3. And I think you're pointing out saying that even if they were equal, it would still be a hole. OK. So what's happening, so, so the, the condition, the, net, the, the condition to be here uh, is that the multiplicity of this particular 0 in the numerator is greater or equal <coughs> to the multiplicity of the same zero in the denominator. Now actually this is almost right, but this condition is not quite right. And it has to do with a, with a corner case of the definition that you just haven't put your gaze on yet. So I have a question. <coughs> um, concern, concerning the numerator, what are the zeros of the numerator? One, three, One, three and five. Okay. Uh, what is the multiplicity of three in the denominator? Two. Two. Uh, what is the multiplicity of five in the denominator? Three. three. Now here's the question. Concerning 1, what is the multiplicity of 1 in the denominator? 0. zero. Okay, how, how many times is it a 0? Zero times. Okay. So now, what's the multiplicity of 1 in the numerator? 1. And what's the multiplicity of 1 in the denominator? 0. zero. Is 1 more than 0? Yes. Does that satisfy this condition as it's presently written? Yes. yes. But is, is, one, is, is one a whole? No, what is it? it 
it's a, it's a zero, right? It's what it actually is. It's a zero of the whole function. It's, it's an intercept. So we need, to, we need to add one more condition to make this right. So what do we need to add? Right. So, so and, <laughs> and <coughs> the multiplicity of that zero in the denominator is at least one. Very good. Uh, well, in this case, what's a zero? So let's try and describe what it what it should be. Okay, I like it. So uh, the multiplicity in the numerator is uh, at least one and what? Okay, very good. The multiplicity in the denominator is exactly zero. Okay, so that's what it means to be a zero. <coughs> uh, what will it mean to be a, a, a vertical asymptote? Okay, uh, so the multiplicity in the denominator is strictly greater than uh, the multiplicity in the numerator. Okay, so here's some, some nice rules to figure out how to classify the points of a rational function. Okay? So one of, one of our exercises will be, okay, do that. Uh, classify all the points of a rational function. Any question about this kind of exercise? Okay, so in my experience, most students do, could, could, could have come up with all of this themselves with the exception of this one. This one seems to be a blind spot. This little bit. <laughs> okay. One last problem concerning polynomials and rational functions, things like that. <clears throat> Is uh, solving this kind of problem. Uh, how about we have. <clears throat> 2x minus 1 divided by x minus 8 is less than or equal to 1. Okay, and we want to solve this. Okay, so uh, what's, the, what's the general way to go about solving such a nonlinear inequality? By hand. <laughs> How do you do it by hand? Hmm. Move this to the, to the other side? Move x minus 8, like multiply Okay, so uh, that's not okay. <laughs> we, we don't have any guarantee that x minus 8 is positive, so that direction of the inequality is Th This is exactly the problem, is that if you multiply both sides by x minus 8, and that means that now the, the problem splits into two realms. So, so, so this statement, as I have it written, can't possibly be true, uh, because uh, it, it could only be true if x is more than 8. If x happens to be less than 8, then we would have needed to reverse the, uh, the, sign of the, the direction of the inequality. Okay, so this is, this is kind, of, kind of a risky way to go about trying to, trying to deal with this. So I'm going to say, no, let's, let's not do that. 
instead, I'm going to do something that I'm going to I'm going to go about solving this in a in a different way. And for those of you who've taken calculus, you'll probably get a strong echo of something that you do all the time in calculus. Okay, so rather than than trying to do it this way, I'm going to do it the follow the following way. So in the first place, I'm going to consider what's the natural domain of this expression? Everything but eight. I don't mean that the solution is everything but eight. I just mean that in principle you could evaluate this inequality anywhere except eight. So the natural domain is negative infinity to eight union eight to infinity. I always do have a little joke with myself about doing these kind of problems. I usually select eight so that this looks funny. <laughs> Doesn't that look funny? It looks like the infinities are just rotating. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so that means that we could do, we could do anything but eight. Uh, and then the way we're going to algebraically solve this is I'm going to do 2x minus 1 over x minus 8. And then I'll move the 1 to the other side so that it looks like this. Now I'll get a common denominator. Uh, and obtain 2x minus 1 over x minus 8, and then subtract x minus 8 over x minus 8, less or equal to 0. And then now they have the same denominator, and so now they can be, uh, be we, we can deal with it in that way. So 2x minus 1, and then from that we'll subtract x minus 8 over x minus 8, less or equal to 0. <coughs> so that'd be 2x is minus 1x, so that'd be x. And then uh, negative 1 minus negative 8, uh, that would be 7. So x plus 7 over x minus 8, with af after a little bit of algebra. Uh, so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve an equation, specifically what I'm going to do. And what I'd like for you to observe, I performed those, al those algebraic operations. And how many times did I multiply both sides of the, in in the inequality by something? Zero times, right? I didn't do that at all. So there's no way I could have accidentally forgotten to switch the direction of the inequality, because I just didn't do it. I couldn't have, for I couldn't have omitted that. So if I'm going to solve, so now I'm going to solve the associated equation. I, we, already, we already established that we're talking about anything but 8. Okay, so then uh, as a result of that, now I'm going to multiply both sides by x minus 8. And if you multiply both sides by x minus 8, what do you get? Right, you, you get this. Now. Do you, also do you also observe that because now I'm dealing with an equation, uh, I don't have to worry about switching the direction of the equation because that's not even a thing? Okay, so then x is negative 7. So what I, what I want you to observe is that at this point, uh, at this point we have identified two interesting values. What two interesting values have we found? 8 and negative 7. So, now we're going to make a sign chart. And specifically, we're going to plot those, those points of interest. <coughs> we're going to plot, uh, and I'm going to represent them as fence posts. So this is, uh, the one on the left is negative 7, and the one on the right is 8. And specifically, now what are we going to do now that we've selected those two points? We've found those two points. Yeah, so we've, we've cut all of, the, all of the reals into these three regions. So I'll select a point to the left here. So how about negative 10? Something in the middle, how about 1? And then something to the right of this, how about 9? So normally, you know, you know, if, if you've done this a lot, you probably would have selected negative 8, but I didn't want that to get somehow confused with this 8. So I just didn't do that. So now that we've made those three selections, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to plug them into what? 
into this one. Now we're going to plug them into what? That one, right? The one that was the result of our hard fought algebraic work. So we're going to plug them into there. And specifically, we're not really interested in the exact value. What are we interested in? Just the sign, which is why this is called a sign chart. Suppose you plug negative 10 into the numerator, then what's the sign? Into the numerator. It would be negative. And in the denominator? Also negative. Okay, suppose, now for the next region. Suppose you plug 1 into the numerator? Positive. And the denominator? Negative. negative. And in the rightmost region? Positive over positive, right? So then the overall sign in each region is what? Positive and then negative and then positive. Okay, so it, this is the reason why it's called a sign chart. Because, uh, well, it's a chart and it's all full of signs. Uh, what is the thing? So I mentioned that watching watching this occur should remind you strongly of something that you did in calculus. So what 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 is this just like? What is it? Yeah, like like the derivative test. For example, the first derivative test is the construction of a slope chart, which is the, which is to say it's a sign chart of the first derivative, and the, a, a concavity chart is is uh, is a sign chart of the second derivative. What's, it, what's, what's the name for a sign chart of a third derivative? So you've got slope chart, concavity chart. <laughs> it's actually called a jerk chart. <laughs> can, can you believe that? <laughs> that does ring well. Yeah. <laughs> yes? And then isn't it snap, crackle, crackle? Yeah, it, it is, yeah. Is that because of uh, physics? Yeah. Yeah, it's a... It's a the, the rate of change of acceleration is referred to as jerk. <laughs> we can thank the physicists for that. Uh, at any rate, now that we have assigned a label to each region, uh, we either want all of the positive regions or we want all of the negative regions. Now, how do we tell which, which flavor it is that we want? Right. So this one is saying this expression less or equal, zero. So which ones are the ones we're looking for? The ones labeled negative. So we want the negative regions. So are there any negative regions? Sure there are. Uh, there's this region in the middle. Then, then the last question is, is uh, OK, that, that means that, that that region is an interval. Uh, what, what about the endpoints? Do we want the endpoints? Do we not want them? So you're saying inc yes, include negative seven, and what? Do not include negative eight. So what? What's? I mean, do you, you do you have something against eights or what? Ah, because of the domain, right? Because of the domain. So specifically, specifically, if you were to plot this, if you were to plot this, it is a rational function after all what kind of thing is occurring at negative 7? It's a 0, right? What kind of thing is occurring at 8? An asymptote. How, how can you know for sure, according to the previous page, that negative 7 is a 0? Th that's true, but you need another thing in order for it to be. And the multiplicity is 0 in the denominator. Okay, and then s similarly, uh, otherwise, so sign chart. Any question about this? So the last the, one of the an, another thing that we'll do for for this week's programming assignment is is programmatically construct a sign chart just like this. Okay, so have a nice Thursday.